Smith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Mass., and the United States Golf Association Museum in Far Hills, New Jersey, where it's part of the capital projects that recapitulated and, re and rebuilt two sport museums. Among the books he has written include The Spas, The Life and Times of Basketball's Greatest Jewish Team, where Basketball is Jewish, and the James Naismith Reader Basketball in, in His Own Words. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Doug Stark. Okay, um, thank you, Dave, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to talking with uh, everyone about Jewish basketball this evening. Um, and I've been on some of the previous talks with Chaim Bloom and Ben Volan, which have been very enjoyable. Um, so we've selected a good evening to talk about basketball. Yesterday, uh, December 21st, 1891, was the day of the first game of basketball in James Naismith's class at uh, what is now Springfield College. Uh, the NBA season starts tonight with a double header. Uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame has announced their finalists to their class th uh, this afternoon. And in last month's NBA draft, the Washington Wizards at the number nine pick drafted uh, Denny uh, Ajiva, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but he's been the highest ever drafted Israeli uh, in NBA history. So uh, what I thought I'd do is just give you a little bit of a background and I have a, a short uh, PowerPoint presentation and then I'm sure we can open it up for some, uh, for some chatting and some questions. Um, my first job uh, over 20 years ago was at the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield and I was working there and um, uh, on the wall in one of the exhibits was a photo of this Jewish basketball team and all the players' jerseys uh, had uh, Hebrew letters on it. And it sort of got me interested in Jewish basketball. I then uh, went on to research and write uh, a book called The Spas, The Life and Times of Basketball's Greatest Jewish Team. Uh, that's uh, the South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. And they played from 1918 uh, to 1959. So they started as a club team. They played professionally uh, in the 30s in the American Basketball League. Well, and they became one of the touring teams in the 50s uh, to the Harlem Globetrot. Uh, and they traveled throughout the country, mostly the East, uh, the West, and the um, Midwest, um, and they challenged uh, racial stereotypes and inferiority as they would boost the game's popularity. And then a couple years ago, I did some other uh, research into a book when basketball was Jewish, Voices of Those Who Played the Game. And this is really 20 you know, oral histories that, that you want to give out to um, um, which I did on my own and some of which I found in some libraries. The white and it, it goes from 1900 to 1960, and it focuses uh, sort of on those who played, coached, and refereed the game in those check. early years and what it meant to be like uh, a Jew and how the game. And they'll say like every month is high. Changed fact, a lot uh, over you know, that time. Somebody I spoke to a couple of days ago said, so, said in 18 months, as I mentioned, uh, basketball was invented in 1891. Uh, they were looking for a sport to that person saying, I made a donation bridge the football and baseball talk season. In the background. Mm -hmm. There's a background talking. Yeah, maybe you should mute everybody. Like doing those because Dave Mandel, be quiet. Yeah, why don't you move, why don't you mute everybody? Because somebody is talking about the personal. Yeah, you mute mute everybody. I'd like to sort of figure out what. Someone's talking about what? Some idiot is talking. Do you mute us? I think he's not. Hopefully. Fine. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll speak to 137 people. No, there you go. Oh, and then what did you do? Can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so basketball was invented in uh, 1891 in Springfield by James Naismith, and then it 
really quickly spread through the YMCA's and YMHA's uh, throughout the country. And uh, by the end of the 1890s, there were professional leagues in uh, New Jersey and Philadelphia. This coincided with the period where uh, Jews were immigrating from Europe um, and looking to start a better life. Uh, a lot of their parents worked a lot of time and hours and long hours and the children uh, were looking to assimilate and become American. And one way to do that was sports. Uh, many of them lived in urban areas or in tenement houses. And so the neighborhoods and the apartments were crowded. There weren't any ball fields for baseball, but basketball didn't require much, just a hoop, a peach basket, uh, and some sort of a ball, or you could roll up rags or newspapers. So it became a very inexpensive way uh, to play basketball. Um, and so that's what happened. So roughly around the turn of the century, as basketball was starting out, Jews were uh, populating the urban areas and basketball became largely uh, an, urban, an urban sport. Um, so I will um, show you the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, Okay, I guess if everyone could probably see that. Um, so when basketball was Jewish chronicles about a 60 year period uh, from 1900 to 1960, and it talks about um, coaches, players, referees, um, what there, it was oral histories that I edited, some of which I've done, some of which I found uh, at the Basketball Hall of Fame or the New York Public Library. Um, and it really just sort of talks about uh, their lives. So I thought I'd go through just a handful of them just to give everyone a, a flavor of some of these individuals and their accomplishments and the different periods that they, uh, they were instrumental. So this first guy you see is Les Harrison. Uh, Les is from Rochester. Um, he played a, a little bit, but his claim to fame is um, more as a coach and a manager. Uh, he and his brother bought a franchise called the Rochester Royals, uh, which played in the National Basketball League and later in the early years of the National Basketball Association. Uh, they won a couple of uh, championships along the way. Uh, but in 1946, right after World War II, he was instrumental in helping to integrate uh, professional basketball. Um, he had a team in Rochester and another uh, Jewish owner Ben Kerner had a team in uh, Tri-Cities, the first in Buffalo, and then it moved to, uh, to Tri-Cities out in Iowa. And they agreed to uh, both help integrate the league um, with Pop Gates and Dolly King. And it should also be noticed that, noted that around this time, the World War II 1940s period, uh, Jews were instrumental in helping professional basketball integrate. In uh, 1942, in, an, in a league that predated the NBA, um, um, there was a team in Toledo and a gentleman, their, their coach, Sid Goldberg, uh, helped to integrate. So this was uh, five years before Jackie Robinson. Then you had Les Harrison. And then you had uh, Red Auerbach and the Celtics in 1950. Uh, they integrated um, by drafting Chuck Cooper uh, in the uh, NBA draft. So he was the first African-American drafted. Uh, this next gentleman uh, is Harry Litwack. Uh, some of you might have heard of him. So he, uh, he was from Philadelphia. He went to Temple University. Um, he played He played in the late 20s and uh, early 30s with the Spas. So you can tell the Hebrew lettering uh, on his jersey. This was sort of typical of the uniforms of that period, you know, uh, very tight shorts, uh, sort of sneaker type shoes. He was sort of a stocky player, uh, left handed. Um, he was a very good player. He later became the coach uh, for the freshman team at Temple for 20 years and served as a coach with the Spas. And then when he became head coach at Temple, he won the 1969 NIT championship and also the, um, 
uh, led the team to two final fours. Um, he coached uh, uh, Hal Greer uh, was one of his one of his players. Okay, um, next on this list is um, Joel Shiky Godhofer. Uh, he was from um, New York City. Uh, he uh, grew up in the Bronx, um, and he was the uh, probably the best player for the Spas during the 1930s. Uh, he led the team to five championships. He's won two MVP awards. Um, you can tell, you can, might see a little bit on his jersey. It says Philadelphia Hebrews. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was a very rough sport. So um, he wore knee pads. It wasn't uncommon for players to wear knee pads. You know, uh, in more recent years, you know, Bill Walton, and Patrick Ewing uh, sported knee pads a lot. But can you hear it? Back in the uh, 20s and 30s, knee pads were, uh, were quite popular. Uh, this gentleman is Mo Goldman. He was also a, a New York City product. He was from Brooklyn. Um, he didn't start playing until a uh, junior in high school, and he went to the City College of New York, and he played for uh, Nat Holman, uh, the famed coach at CCNY. Uh, he played with the uh, Spas in the 20s. Yeah in the in the 30s uh what's notable about him is uh prior to him centers were were not offensively minded uh they sort of you don't hear anything might be these women they played um oh he said alice mute yourself how do i do that so mo was a um was one of the first centers who could play offensively and defensively uh, which was a change in the game uh, this guy is uh dutch garfinkel he was also from uh, brooklyn he uh, played at st john's under joe lapchik He, so um, most people know, you know, Dick McGuire and Bob Cousy and Bob Davies as- uh, Can't hear anything? Uh, some of the uh, slick passers in the early, um, can everyone hear me? Yep. Perfectly. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. So- um, Please remind everyone to stay muted. Thank you, speaker. Okay. Um, he was the speaker muted himself. Uh, Bob Davies um, or Dick McGuire. He was one of the first um, uh, players, uh, guards who was sort of a flashy player. Uh, this is Ozzy Sheckman. Ozzy Sheckman's claim to fame. Uh, he played at LIU. Um, Long Island you University. He, he scored the first basket in NBA history, uh, November 1st. 19... I don't know why you can't hear this unless it's because it's oh, 1946 um, for the New York Knicks when they played Toronto. Uh, most people think of the Raptors today, but Toronto had a team, uh, the Toronto Huskies, and he scored the first basket uh, in NBA history. Yeah, you could. This is Ralph Kaplowitz. Uh, he went to NYU and then um, lost five years of his career uh, during uh, World War II. He was a fighter pilot um, in the Pacific Theater. And then afterwards, he, um, he played for the Spas. He played for the New York Knicks and also the Philadelphia Warriors um, after World War II. Um, Red Klotz, a number of you might have heard about Red. He started with the Spas, but he later became the uh, owner, coach, and player for the um, Washington Generals, which became the team that uh, lost for about 50 years to the Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, and he did more to promote the game uh, globally than anyone. Um, after World War II, Max Zaslowski, was one of the early stars uh, of the NBA. He went to St. John's and he played uh, with Fort Wayne, Chicago, Baltimore, Milwaukee. 
Um, and when he when he retired, he was the NBA's third leading scorer at the time. Um, there was his another of his claim to fame is he was part of the uh, dispersal draft in 1950 after the Chicago team folded. Um, Andy Zaslowski was selected by the Knicks. Andy Phillips was selected by Philadelphia. And a guard from Tri-Cities named Bob Cousy was selected uh, by the Celtics. So um, Max Zaslowski was part of that um, part of that draft, uh, dispersal draft. And then I'm sure most of you uh, have heard about Dolph Shays, um, who was uh, during the 1950s, um, was really one of the top players in NBA history. And um, he played for the Syracuse Nationals and um, is one of the top 50 players of all time. And his son, Danny Shays, enjoyed an 18-year career uh, in the NBA. Hello, hello. Hi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it, I'm having a hard time because you have the big screen on. But if you can hear me, you must mute your phone. You must mute right now. So we're going to stop this. Stop Everyone, this. Go Everyone go to mute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Something was a no. Okay, whoever just said something is, is a female, and I can't find you, and I'm trying to mute everyone. Okay, Danny, it looks like Danny, it's Alice Wolf. Danny, it's Tom. The problem. Please, Danny, it's Tom. Please make me the host. I'm trying. It's hard because of the way the screen is. I don't want to do it. He's calling everybody up. He's saying everybody has to mute it. You are whoever is talking right now who's it, saying he's saying, saying everyone is muted that. is not muted. So just, I know how to mute. It. Ellis, that is the problem. You're the problem. Thank God. Okay, sorry about that. Go on, please. Okay. Um, so those are the figures highlighted in the book. This was my, my first book about the spas, and I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about this woman about these has guys. got to mute herself or get away, go away from this meeting. I'm not, or I'm leaving. So this is uh, one of the you muted the speaker. Um, the, the, so the spas were a club team. They were founded in 1918. Um, they played till 1959. Um, they were really the greatest Jewish basketball team of all time. Uh, this is one of their players, uh, Inky Lautman. You can get a sense of what the players looked like, the uh, Hebrew lettering on his jersey. Um, this was taken in a studio somewhere in Philadelphia, but he, uh, he played 14 seasons uh, with the team. Uh, this is a, just a rendering uh, after they won. Uh, as I mentioned, they won um, uh, seven championships uh, in 12 years uh, during the 30s and early 40s. Uh, this is one of their um, one of their jackets, one of their warm-up jackets um, during the 30s. This was uh, a gentleman, Cy Castleman. Um, Cy um, later uh, helped Wilt Chamberlain with his uh, foul shooting. Those of you might remember, Wilt Chamberlain was not a very good uh, foul shooter. Um, and the team was uh, founded by Eddie Gottlieb, who you might know as um, being key in the history of the NBA and making the schedule um, and drafting Wilt Chamberlain to play for Philadelphia. So basketball at that time was not that popular. And uh, to get this sport more popular, um, they had dances sometimes before at halftime or after the games. And usually the spas had their uh, dances after the games and they had a player, Gil Fitch, who was very musically inclined. So after the game, he would uh, run in a locker room, put on his tuxedo and with his band, the Gil Fitch Orchestra, they would play for an hour or two and all of the uh, 3000 people, mostly single uh, Jews would dance and uh, meet somebody and get married. Um, and so uh, that's how they raised awareness and extra money uh, to keep the teams going. The team played at the Broadwood Hotel, which is uh, the corner of Broad and Wood. It no longer stands today, but it is a, um, it is a parking lot 
uh, for Hahnemann Hospital. Uh, this is a sample um, ticket. Um, usually in the 30s, it was 65 cents for men to attend a game and 35 cents for women to attend. Um, so they put out a, uh, a little four page um, program um, and um, this was put out by their PR guy, uh, Dave Zinkoff. For those of you who might remember the Philadelphia Sixers, 76ers, he was the uh, PA announcer for them for, for many years. He got his start in the 30s uh, doing public uh, announcing and creating the uh, spa sparks um, for the spas and was a lifelong friend of uh, Eddie Gottlieb. And he sort of helped the team um, promote itself. And then obviously uh, during the 80s with the, um, with the 76ers. So I know that's sort of a, um, a very quick, <laughs> quick history through, uh, through uh, Jewish basketball, but I thought um, I, would, um, I would stop there and see if anyone had any, any questions or comments or anything, um, anything to discuss. Can we mention something now or? Sure. Uh, being from Philadelphia, I think, as I recall, the spas, they were the, the, the big basis when the NBA started for the, for the Philadelphia Warriors. A lot of the spas moved on to the, uh, to the, to the Warriors. I don't know if you, know, if you recall that. They weren't the starters, but they were a lot of the, of the uh, second line players on the NBA team. That, that's right. So, so Eddie Gottlieb um, ran the spas for many, many years. And after World War II, the Basketball Association was founded. Um, and Philadelphia was awarded a team which became the Philadelphia Warriors. And Eddie Gottlieb took over that team. Uh, and his buddy Harry Litwack sort of ran the spas, which became more of a minor league team. And But yes, a lot of the, uh, the number of the spas players did move over. Uh, one of which was a guy, Alexander P.D. Rosenberg, um, and he was instrumental with the team. But that is correct. A, a number of the Spas players did move over. Do you, do you have any uh, information or do any research on the number of fans that were at the games typically and what percentage of them were Jewish, would you say? Mm -hmm. So the Spas played their home games at the Broadwood Hotel, uh, and it was a ballroom. So you go up to the second floor and there would just be sort of seats laid out in the, go ahead, in the you can... balcony. So they had about 3000 at the max. Um, I think that was the high end of teams during the thirties and early forties. I think mostly, you know, maybe 2000, 2500 uh, with some of the other teams in the league. Basketball was largely um, uh, Jewish at that time, you know, probably, half of the players in the, in the American Basketball League in the 30s were Jewish. And um, I would say most of the people, at least attending the Spas games were Jewish. That wasn't always the case when they played on the road, uh, but certainly in Philadelphia it was. Uh, I, I, would thought, I would have thought you would talk more about Nat Holman. In the first 50 years of basketball, he was voted number one player of all time. Yeah, so Nat, Nat Holman is, is in the book. Um, he's, he's from New York. Um, he went to, he played at City College of New York. He also had a, a baseball tryout um, with the Cincinnati Reds. Um, and, um, but he really made his uh, claim to fame uh, as a coach uh, with CCNY uh, during the 30s and 40s into the 50s. Um, CCNY won both the NCAA and NIT championships in, um, in 1951, 50 or 51. Uh, he was really instrumental as a player. He played with the original Celtics, which were a uh, barnstorming team uh, with Joe Laptrick and a number of those. And he was really one of the best players in the 20s and early 30s. And then he became a coach. And then he was instrumental in helping basketball get to um, – get to Israel. Um, 
I will also say there is a new book out called The City Game uh, by a gentleman, Matthew Goodman, and that really chronicles uh, Holman and CCNY and the gambling scandal uh, and that period uh, of basketball history, and it's really very good. Hi there, Stephen. I have a question. Did anti-Semitism in recent sports and basketball change in any yeah. way that people are reviewing the game? That people are, any comments on what's going on in terms of some of the players that um, have made some remarks and Charles Barkley sort of coming out um, in a good way, etc. Any comments on what's going on now in basketball? Yeah, there there is. I mean, I think there is a little bit. I know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote an editorial, I believe, in uh, the early during the early stages of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there is some, I mean, you know, there's not that many Jewish players. Normally they're sort of owners or executives, but there is some, there is some anti-Semitism, you know, and even when I was um, talking to some of the guys from my book, they, they wouldn't go in, um, um, they wouldn't really go into a lot of the anti-Semitism that they faced then. Um, and I think there's a little bit now, I'm just a little bit not as, as aware. Of, of some of it now, but, you know, Barkley has made some comments and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has, uh, has as well, um, su uh, supporting uh, Jews and Jewish basketball and, and that as well. Doug, can you tell us anything about um, Jewish players that actually moved to Israel and played, you know, anything about Tal Bori, Lou Silver, and others that helped Israel, Maccabi Tel Aviv, to, um, win the championship, European championship in the early 80s and later on? Yeah, you know, um, as you mentioned, Tal Brody um, was a key uh, player in, in, uh, in Israeli basketball. Um, there was a player for Duke University about 15 or 20 years ago, John Shire, who's played a, a good part of his career uh, in Israel. Um, uh, a few years ago, the Cleveland Cavaliers had a coach, David Blatt, who had coached overseas. He's from uh, Massachusetts. Um, I don't know as much about a lot of these um, uh, players that have gone back to play in the Israeli league. Um, UConn, University of Connecticut men's team, had uh, Duran Schaefer in Israeli, and before that, Nadav Hennefeld who played for them. Um, and I think they might've gone back as well um, and played there. Um, but I don't think anything has been written extensively on Israeli basketball to my knowledge. And there, and there, there was that player, uh, Omri Caspi, who's been in the league for a number of years. And now there's a new uh, Israeli player who was drafted by the Wizards. Um, and there's another uh, gal, Mechel, um, I believe he, if I got his name right, he's, uh, he was with, I think, Dallas last year or, or in recent years. So there is a handful. I'm just. Um, uh, there's, a great, really there's, a, there's a movie about the championship team in the 1970s called, yeah. I think it's called, We Were Put on the Map, which was a quote from Tal Brody. That team also included a, a guard from Long Island University named Barry Lebowitz. Or Lebowitz. You know about Stoudemire, the is he the black player who yeah, found Amari out he was Stoudemire, Jewish? He's not only that, he's colorful. Yeah, so my understanding with Amari Stoudemire, who played most of his career with Phoenix, is that he converted to Judaism after his playing days. But uh, right. that's that's, um, that's all I know about Amari Stoudemire. Does he not know more about him? You know more? In the mid seventies, do you have any comments about a lot of Jewish referees in the NBA over the years? Did you ever cover that, including Manny, Sokol Manny Sokolovsky, who went as Manny Sokol? Yeah, there there were a, n a number of uh, referees. There was uh, a gentleman, Mendy Rudolph, who was a oh, core character. Rudolph. Uh, Norm Drucker, who was also a referee in, uh, in the NBA and uh, also became the head of officials as well. Adolph Shays also became the head of officials 
uh, for a while in, in the NBA, but there were a number of uh, Jewish referees in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, I don't think there's many, if at all, now, but uh, Mendy Rudolph was probably the most colorful character of that period. Yeah. How about Abe Saperstein and the uh, Globetrotters? So, um, you know, the Globetrotters played a really important uh, role in basketball history. Um, so Abe Saperstein team uh, was founded in the late twenties um, and they took the name Harlem because Harlem was uh, from New York and that had a sort of a global um, or at least a national sort of recognition, even though they were based uh, out of Chicago uh, for years, he really kept in the fifties, he kept the professional game alive uh, in a lot of ways um, the NBA was not financially doing well, and a lot of the NBA teams had double headers with the Globetrotters, um, and uh, he kept them going. Um, when the NBA started uh, drafting uh, black players, uh, that changed uh, changed a little bit. But then in the '60s, um, Saperstein ran the American Basketball League for a couple of years, and that was really a, a far-reaching league. They had the three-pointer, which everyone knows today. They had the red, white, and blue ball. Uh, it was a much more exciting, uh, high-scoring, up-and-down affair uh, that you see today. But the Globetrotters uh, were really important uh, to pro basketball in the 40s and 50s, um, and he had a really good relationship with Eddie Gottlieb and, and the uh, Spas and... Um, just kept professional basketball going. I, in the 60s, the uh, college player of the year, two years in a row, Art Heyman and Barry Kramer. Do you, do you, re, you must have recalled seeing them. Yeah, I mean, Art Heyman was a little bit before my time, but uh, he was a Duke player um, and uh, really very good. One of the first great two players uh, in the 60s that got the program sort of off and running. Um, but that's it. I mean, you know, my, my research sort of ended by the 60s, so I haven't had a chance to sort of pick up players like uh, Art Heyman or Jack Molinas uh, or some of the other players from the 60s and into the 70s. But Art Heyman was certainly up there. Uh, Barry Kramer was really an outstanding player at NYU uh, in the early 60s. Uh, Jack Molinas, I think, was more notorious than famous, uh, <laughs> as you probably know. I'm not sure that we want to take credit for him exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, some of you might know the, uh, the author, Charlie Rosen, who's written a lot of uh, sports books and basketball books. He's written a book on Jack Molinas. But yeah, um, Jack was a, um, uh, he got into gambling heavy and was, was ultimately banned and um, didn't quite work out. So, um, uh, for sure. And Barry Kramer, I believe became a, uh, a judge, uh, in New York. Molina's but, book. Oh, correct. Barry Kramer. Kramer became Kramer. a dentist. Kramer, no, Nat Dambroff became a dentist. Barry Kramer went to law school and was a Supreme Court judge in New York. Oh, yeah, from Schenectady, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to mention the, uh, probably the... Hello, thank you. Neither Kramer nor Heyman made it big in the pros. They were both Art. busts. As a matter of Art fact, I Art played Heyman. against Art Heyman, and he was an obnoxious turd. <laughs> hey, you probably haven't mentioned the best uh, Jewish player of all time, Je uh, Rick Barry. Yeah, I um, I was less aware of Rick Perry. I've always considered uh, or thought that Dolph Shays um, was was the best Jewish player. Well, Rick Barry was pretty good. Yeah, Rick Barry was good as well, for sure. I didn't know Rick Barry was Jewish. I don't think he is. His wife was. Oh, okay. It, it, that Rick Barry was not Jewish. His uh wife was and his father-in-law Bruce Hale was Jewish so as he grew up he brought up his children Jewish but he was not Jewish how about Ernie Grunfeld 
Yeah, so uh, Ernie Grunfeld played college at Tennessee and then played with the Knicks yeah. for a while in the 70s and 80s and uh, ran the Washington team for a while. He was very good, um, played on the Maccabee teams and mm-hmm. involved with uh, Israeli sports as well. Um, Doug? Yes. Can you tell us about ABA League? The ABA um so the American Basketball Association was around for about nine years in the 60s and 70s. It eventually merged with the, um, with the NBA. Uh, four of the teams moved over. But it, was, uh, it, it started out with uh, George Mikan as the commissioner, um, who was the first great NBA center in the 50s. Um, you know, it was very much a run-and-gun league. Um, and... But uh, there, there is a book out by Terry Pluto called Loose Balls, which is uh, fantastic. If anyone wants a little bit more uh, about, um, about the ABA. So uh, to support your um, Ralph Kaplowitz in the Air Force, I've got pictures. My father played on a basketball team with him in the Air Force uh, base in Galveston, Texas. When he was a fighter pilot in training, this was the training base for um, you know fighters in World War II. And I've got some pictures of him and my father in the starting five of this team. And there's some, um, I've got a clipping where uh, they won. My father scored two late baskets to win the game, although Kaplowitz scored 21 of the 42 points the team scored that day. I mean, he was the you know massive center and everybody collapsed on him all the time, but he did play in World War II in the Air Force uh, during that time period. Great. No, thank you. There were a lot of um, uh, service teams during World War II, uh, which was very, um, very popular and kept the game going a lot. So that's a great story. Thank you. Um, so somebody in the chat mentioned the commissioners, David Stern and Adam Silver. Actually, the first commissioner in the NBA, Maurice Podolov, uh, was Jewish as well. So three out of the five NBA commissioners uh, have been Jewish. What about coaches? Jewish coaches, uh, Larry Brown, David Blatt. That's right. So Larry, Larry Brown, David Blatt, uh, Red Auerbach, or Red Holtzman with the Knicks. Um, um, Lawrence Frank, who coached the Nets for a while, was Jewish. Um, Dolph Shays was briefly a head coach. Um, and it'll look just be yourself. So um, I see there's a, a Rothstein. There was uh, somebody on the Heat staff. Um, I can't remember his first name offhand, but Rothstein was a coach. Um, so there was... Um, there were a number of them. Now I think most of them are sort of owners of league. Rothstein's first name was Ron. Ron. Ron Rothstein, yes. Um, Eddie Fogler, that's right, played at UNC. He, he coached mainly in college. Um, There's been a lot of college coaches. A lot. Of, that's right, a lot of college coaches. The coach at uh, Auburn right now, Bruce Pearl. Uh, Bruce Newton, Frog. Mass. Yeah, Sharon, Massachusetts, that's right. Newton. Uh, I forget his name, but the coach at Yeshiva University in the 50s was a long time. Everybody gives him many accolades as being the great, great coach uh, from Yeshiva University. Uh, it's Red, yeah, Sar- Red Sarachek. Red Sarachek. He, he groomed a lot of guys. You have any information on Red Skernick? I'm sorry, on, on who was that? Fred Sternick. He played for the Philadelphia Hebrews. I, I, I don't. I, I don't. Um, in Chicago in 1940.
Um, Doug, um, yes. Barry Bauck, a, a couple of questions. One is, um, has material about Jews and basketball been collected also in any of the Jewish museums, to your knowledge? The one in Philadelphia, the one in New York, perhaps? Um, so so the, bas the Basketball Hall of Fame uh, has some team trophies and uniforms. Um, let's see. Uh, Philadelphia has some stuff. Um, but uh, my impression is that whatever still exists is with the families. Uh, I don't think there's much that has made it into these museums that I've confined. I think it's very sparse. Every now and then you might see some stuff like particularly with the, with the Philadelphia spas that shows up on eBay. But uh, I, my impression is a lot of this pre 1950s, uh, memorabilia for Jewish basketball is largely with the families. There's, there's very little at uh, some of these uh, museums. Yeah, it's a shame that it's not being shared. The, the other question I had is that, uh, as you mentioned also, basketball has become so huge in Israel. It's like every piddly little shtetl town in Israel has a basketball team now. So do you think the strong influence that basketball has in Israel may actually now serve to, to for a resurgence of Jews and basketball here in the United States? You know, it, it might, you know, I mean, basketball is such a global game. They've done extremely well, um, the few that have made it to the NBA, but I think it might, uh, I think it might, um, um, I think we'll have to see how this, uh, this top pick for the Washington is, but the Israeli leagues are very strong, and um, and I think David Blatt, somebody like him, has has done really well overseas, and I think that people like him will will help help uh, Israeli players and Jewish players making it to the uh, NBA. He's very sick. My, my grandkids have played in Israel teams that come to the United States for the summer to play other Jewish schools throughout the country. But you got the problem there. The good kids, they go in the army. By the time they come out, they're not ready to play basketball. Most of them. Well, the fact is, they don't. They don't go to the military if they are really good. They let them off the military if they're really, really good. Like Danny Avadia, for example, he, they let him skip the military because he's such a, a special. And also, there is a new uh, draft this year by the Boston Celtics. Um, it was draft very, very late, but I forgot his name. Also in Israel, he is a guard that just uh, was drafted by the Celtics. Neither one of them actually uh, went to the FDA. Lenny Rosenbluth was on the 1957 uh, North Carolina, University of North Carolina, and he played for the uh, Philadelphia Warriors. That's right, yeah. He was big time. The other thing I wanted to mention was that I read the book by Rosen on Jack Molinas, and he had something like 160 IQ. He was brilliant. He got thrown out of the uh, NBA for betting on his team. And then he went to Brooklyn Law School, got a law degree. And um, then he got involved with the mob. Um, he, um, he was, is he, the, but he went to jail on the uh, scandals, I think the 61 scandal he was the ma he was the master of that one and he went to Attica and he was so smart that the warden would let him out to uh, handle his stock portfolio um, that's how smart he was but he was not exactly smart uh, he got into uh, making films in, uh, in in California you know in Hollywood and he owed the mob money, and uh, he was subject to a hit. That's how he died. Well, by the way, the guy, the Celtics drafted Yam Madar. He's the 47th pick, but he's not, he's, um, he's staying in Israel for a year. He's playing for Hapoel. Okay, so I'm glad you guys were able to ask questions directly. I, for, I really, uh, would like you to use the chat though, so we get a little bit more structure to this. So if you do have a question, 
for the next few minutes. Just put it into the chat and we'll feed it to our host. Yes. And please, please stay on mute. We seem to struggle tonight with that. Not sure why. Thanks. Okay, so here's a question. Doug, have you collaborated with Avi Sklar? Uh, yeah, so Ari Sklar um, has written about Jewish basketball. I met him many, many years ago when I was starting. I haven't done, um, I haven't worked with him at all since, but he was very helpful at the time. I know he's published. I think he's a professor at Hunter College in New York, uh, and his, his work is also very, very good. Great. All right. So now I have, um, I have a few here. Dave Newmark, Columbia grad, had a long career with the Chicago Bulls in the 70s as their center. I guess that's just a comment. I guess it's not a question. Okay. Here's a question. Anyone recall seeing, more recently than today's topic, Tamir Goodman, the Jewish Jordan, he turned down a full. He turned down a full scholarship in Maryland. I saw him play once while he was at Towson State. Uh, they were very tolerant of his orthodoxy. Let him show up midway through the first half for a game at Delaware. He came in, took over the game. Great shooter and passer. He later played at Haifa in the Israeli league. So and uh, also about um, Tamir, he uh, he comes over like once or twice a year. Um, and then gives um, talks through uh, Hillel's at universities. Uh, and he's on sort of a speaker circuit about basketball and life skills and, and that as well. All right. He got so, in over his head at Maryland. Okay. <laughs> That's a comment. Uh, I have no, another. He wound up transferring to Towson State, and then he went home from there. He, he was he would have been a good mid major for Division One player. But he he wasn't a Maryland player. God. What? You had to forget God for that. He, he's had a good. He, he, he seemed happy. Okay, Doug, I think we, does anyone have any questions? More than comments? Questions? Any other questions? We'll take any, any other questions. I'll show you my hand. No? Okay. All right, Doug, we have a few more minutes if you want to Share with us some more comments. Um, so, I'm just looking through the chat if there's anything that sort of. Um, somebody mentioned that Ernie Grunfeld's parents were Holocaust survivors, which is true. Romania. Um, Romania, yep. Um, Howard Garfinkel, uh, the five-star camp. Um, I think he's up for uh, election in the Basketball Hall of Fame this year. That unbelievable. Yeah, for the five-star camp. Yep. Um, um, in the fit. If I could, I don't know how to use the chat, but in the 50s, the college basketball players in New York, whoever they were, the most of them were Jewish, were the best players in the country in those days.
were there any Jews? So there's a, a, a question about the Midwest image of basketball's origins. Were there any Jews involved in that region or was it mostly the East Coast, New York State? Um, my impression has been um, that it was an urban game and in the East, uh, cities like Baltimore, DC, Philadelphia, and um, New York and Boston had a lot of Jewish players. Um, and there were some in the Midwest, but I think predominantly um, it was a heavier concentration on the East Coast. Um, I think there were some in the Midwest, but I think the East Coast gets um, uh, a lot of the um, credit for the for the uh, Jewish um, uh, involvement in the game. You know, when, when you think of basketball um, today, you don't think of really much Jews playing at the uh, NBA level, but really up until 1950, Jews kept the game of basketball going. Uh, it was a mer very much um, a different sport. And um, um, it was, uh, it was a game that, um, you know, the, the um, helped them become American, which was really very important uh, as their parents were probably speaking Yiddish in the home and working all the time. And, um, you know, they did a lot for the game as coaches uh, with the rules, with the integration, with the style of play uh, as referees, now as owners and commissioners. But I don't think the uh, Jewish influence has really gone away and and I don't suspect it ever will. And somebody mentioned Jewish gamblers, and that's correct as well. Um, oh, isn't the uh, Shark Tank the Maverick? Isn't he Jewish? Yeah, he is. Yeah, Mark Cuban. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Did you ever see the movie, the movie First Basket? Yeah, so there was a, a movie, The First Basket, which came out maybe 15 or so years ago. Uh, and it, um, it does a nice job of sort of chronicling um, some of the early influence of Jews. Um, and I think they begin with Ozzy Schechtman scoring the first basket in NBA history in 1946. Uh, doesn't um, <clears throat> uh, doesn't do a lot with the spas, but it does do a little bit, giving a flavor of uh, of what Jewish basketball is like. And then there's uh, so then there's a question about women's basketball with Nancy Lieberman and Sue Bird. Uh, both are correct. Um, the um, the prior commissioner to the WNBA, Donna. Uh, Orinder, Oriander uh, is Jewish, um, but there's not that many um, uh, in the um, in the NBA uh, in the WNBA. Um, the question of how tall were some of these players? So if you were six feet, you were the center. Um, today you'll be lucky as a six footer to sort of get on the court, but um, mostly it was five six, five seven, five eight, five nine. Uh, but somebody like Mo, Mo Goldman, who I uh, mentioned earlier, who was about 6'1 or 6'2, he was sort of a giant. Um, so if you, were, if you were six feet, you were the center at the time. Um, somebody mentioned about um, the suburbs in the 60s, and that's part of it. Um, you know, they'd be, they'd, you know, Jews had be, become more assimilated in a society then. They moved to the suburbs. Uh, they were pursuing other uh, other areas of interest, you know, whether it be law school or med school. So, um, and they weren't uh, in the urban areas as much. Uh, somebody mentioned um, Jewish broadcasters. Obviously, Johnny Most uh, uh, was one of them um, as well. Um, Marv Albert. Marv Albert, of course, his son Kenny Albert. Um, Marty Glickman. Marty Glickman, for sure. Sam Rosen. Sam Rosen. Um, so there's there's been a lot. Um, 
if I ever did a second volume, there'd be uh, more to choose from than I could, uh, than I could possibly think about. And Dolph Shays was six, eight. Um, so he was, uh, he was a giant uh, at the time. And Jerry Reinsdorf as well. Yeah. Mel Allen. By the way, Mel Allen's real name was Mel or Melvin Israel. Noah, what did you think of the Mandalorian finale of this season? So there's a comment here. I'm not really sure what it means, but maybe you do. Hank Finkel with a question mark. What does that mean? So. Uh, Hank Finkel played for the Celtics. He replaced Bill Russell as the center. Uh, and I always thought he was Jewish uh, based on the name. Uh, and I'm doing some research now into uh, Jewish basketball trading cards. And I've learned that uh, he was not Jewish. Um, but I always thought he was. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> No, he was not Jewish. Someone is verifying. Oh, no. Local guy here. Paul All right, here's Arizine. another question. Paul oh. Arizine, A-R-I-Z-I-N with a question mark. I am, I am not aware that he was Jewish. He was Jewish. He played in the 40s and 50s. He played, yeah, he played with the Philadelphia Warriors, Warriors. Uh, and is a Hall of Famer. Right. And in those days, they played at the six. All right. Yeah. So it, our time is up. Does anyone have one last great question? All right. Oh, here's, a, here's actually a good one. How long did it take you to research your book and write the book? And where can we get the book? Uh, so the spas took five years um, to work on that. And that you can get that through Amazon or eBay. And when basketball was Jewish was maybe about three years. And that you can get, get that in Amazon as well um, or on eBay. Um, but they... They could take you know three to five years depending um what else is going on great all right mr kravitz you want to wrap I it have up a, I have a question. so uh, i want to thank you for joining us for the program this evening i want to thank you to our speaker doug stark in honor of your presentation this evening the fgmc the plant vine in israel as part of our partnership with Wine on the Vine, an exciting new program from the Israel Innovation Fund, a nonprofit foundation that supports Israel's wine industry, arts and entertainment, and the FJMC. Our next event of the Sports Affinity will be on Wednesday, January 6, 2021. That sounds kind of weird to say. Our, our program will be Eric Holtz. He is the manager of the Israel National Baseball Team. If you're interested in presenting or would like to help to present a program, uh, you can please contact me. It's uh, dbkravitz at msn.com. Um, be, I'd be love to talk to you, listen to you. Um, I want to thank you, and I look forward to seeing you at our next program. If you enjoyed our program this evening, please make a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate at the link in the chat. Thank you very much, and good evening. All right, thank you very much, Doug. Great presentation for thank all, you, uh, the, all our too. basketball aficionados. We learned a lot tonight. And thank you again. Uh, and th great turnout, guys. It was a phenomenal turnout. And, thank you. And Marshall Eisman, nice seeing you. <laughs> I've seen all you guys, seen everybody here. He's my, he's, he's my softball coach, or father of. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everyone, have a good night. Hey, Doug, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm going to be in touch, I promise. Thank you. Elliot.
MOT. Great. Tribe in case you Take care. MOT, member of the tribe. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent.